Are you just beginning your divorce and trying to figure out how the heck do you organize all of the papers? Because it's overwhelming. And if you don't organize things correctly and your lawyer sends you to go look for that American Express bill from three years ago, you're going to have to find it. And when you're looking for it, you're going to traumatize yourself. You're going to be scared. You're like, oh, I just saw all these other things and this, and I get triggered. And then I had to shut down and I couldn't get that one paper they needed. So today, Jennifer's going to teach us a system for organizing your divorce. As well, the second part of our, our conversation is on parenting plans. And I love parenting plans. I've been building a course um, and it's very robust. There's so much information in it. And um, today we're going to talk about the things that you need to know to start that parenting plan and make it the best that it can be. So let's go welcome Jennifer. Hi, Jennifer. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me today. I am so happy that you are here because I got to read your book, Strategies and Tips from a Divorce Coach, The Roadmap to Move Forward. Um, a great book. There's so much information in it. As I was reading it, I was just like, um, there's so many pages dog-eared. I'm like, I say stuff like that. Oh yeah, we, we, we agree with this. I'm like, she's got so much in here that I really want to bring some of your knowledge to my audience today. And Let's start off because I'm not good at bios. Will you just tell everyone a little bit about yourself? Sure, my pleasure. So my name is Jennifer Warren Medwin. I have a practice here in Miami called Seeking Empowerment Clarity Through Partnership. And I am a certified divorce coach and a family and marital mediator. Nice, nice. And an author. And an author. And I will say this, that... My, my practice is based on the, how, the empowerment dynamic, which basically means that all humans, no matter what challenges we face, whether it's divorce, death, disease, bankruptcy, et cetera, we are always at choice. Mm -hmm. And that means we have two choices. And what are they? We can decide whether we're victims or creators. Mm -hmm. And my practice and the way I work forward with my clients is helping them to understand that they can start in a place of victimhood. Mm -hmm. And then I teach them the strategies and skills of how to be a creator, how to empower them to move forward in the divorce process. Yeah. And, and the divorce process is getting so complicated. I mean, in, in the, the narc world, they just get they amp it up. It's it's just absolutely out of control. And I know that you help people that are not necessarily divorcing a narcissist. And that's why you've got some extra insight here that I really want to bring in. In your book, you had this section. I loved it. It was the six P's. Can you describe that to me? Sure. The six P's stand for proper planning prevents poor performance and pitfalls. And, you know, I look at divorce in four quadrants. Okay. One of those quadrants is organizing for the divorce process. Mm -hmm. And the more organized you are, the more empowered you feel, the less stress you encounter as you move forward. So it is so important to have proper planning because when you have proper planning, you do prevent poor performance and the 12 biggest mistakes that I like to say in the divorce process, one of them being giving up your own power to the professionals that you work with. And this is so important. I want the listeners to really understand this. In the divorce process, you are the boss. No one is going to be with you when you sign your decree. So it's so important to listen to your inner whispers and to really plan properly as you move through the process. Again, by not preparing and not organizing, you're risking triggering yourself more like you're going to go down. If you have to go find the paper that the lawyer just asked for and you're not organized, it is, it is going to just trigger you and you're going to go back into that freeze mode. So while it's almost impossible to think you want me to organize now while everything's in chaos, 
if you don't do it now, you will dig a thousand times for that one thing they're looking for. And it can take hours if it's not organized. And every time you look and you're looking for it and you pass a thing with all these texts in it, whoop, trigger, right? And you're going to you're gonna keep injuring yourself. So organization, I think, is the key. And again, right at the get-go. But you've got something in your book, which again, love it. It's how to organize the best file system. Can you explain about that? Because I think a lot of people really need to know where to get started. For sure. And you know, getting started, I want to recognize for most individuals is a very hard place, right? It's you have that anticipatory anxiety. So I want to just remind everyone that Divorce has many tentacles, right? Whether you want the divorce or you don't want the divorce, right? And it's important to understand that everybody has a lane. All your professionals have a lane. Mm -hmm. And in terms of organizing for the process, in my book, I talk about three different ways you can do it. And I wouldn't say, I said, I would say that there are advantages and disadvantages to all three systems. However, having a system is an advantage in and of itself, mm -hmm. okay? So one of the systems I use is a binder system. I particularly, I'm 52, I am tech savvy, but not extremely tech savvy. I feel when I wrote my book, I wrote it, I really used pen and paper. And then I, you know, I had many drafts. Anyway, so the binder system is actually creating 20 or 30 tabs that, that relate to your process. What kind of tabs do you need for your attorney? You know, documentation, correspondence, so on and so forth. Same with your accountant. Same if you had a therapist or you use a coach like myself. So you create this binder system. All you need is a six inch binder, paper, a hole puncher, and, um, and some tabs, some dividers. And in my book, I clearly explain which tabs you need to use. It becomes heavy, but then it's, it, you know exactly where to go for the documentation. Another system is the digital system that you can create by yourself. You can go onto your computer and create digital folders mm -hmm. for the exact sort of tabs that I just spoke about mm -hmm. for each of the, the um, professionals that you work with. Another system that is becoming more and more popular is a digital platform where you can input all of your information and it, is, it, is, it encompasses a collaboration with all of your um, professionals. So the attorney can see the documents that the financial advisor or professional is putting on, so on and so forth. And I really like detour.life. Um, as a platform. And um, my clients really find success on a digital platform. So there are three different types of organizational sort of groupings that you can research to see which one best fits you. Mm -hmm. and, and as you were talking, I was writing down, um, I had 5,000 pages and I had to make three of them. Um, but then after I did all that, they still digitized them. So they, I paid someone $300 an hour to scan each one of these. So a lesson that I learned was, you know what, ask them what they're going to do with it. Because if you can get a digital, say, statement and things like that, again, we're trying to help you not have to go back into this and just be like, here you go. Or in my case, spend $1,100 having someone scan all the papers that they were requesting. Uh, yeah. And I wanna say that's a, such an excellent point and thank you for bringing that up. There are free apps that you can download like Turbo Scanner or some, you know, some other scanners and you can actually scan the documents yourself. So you can protect yourself in two ways. You can have the hard copies, because I know for a lot of people that brings them a sense of peace. Mm -hmm. I am one of them. So, <laughs> Me too. and then, yes. And then I also used a free app to scan the documents and send them off to my, the different professionals. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice. 
Um, I also wrote down another thing on um, the discovery. When you're building those folders, let's say you've got a folder for the discovery that the lawyer is asking for. People really need to know to put those in a in years, you know, so that again, if you're looking for the phone bill or the electric bill from you know 2018, you're not sorting. The the, the more details you can get, finite little places that you can put things and know what the structure is. I even had to build like a spreadsheet to know what the hell the structure was. Oh, this is in here. Boom. Okay. I figured it out. Right. Until you get used to it. Anytime we build a new system, it's like, I don't remember where I put it. And now you're still searching. Right. But if you just have it and like write it down and go, all things from lawyers go in here, all Mm -hmm. texts and crazy stuff from the X go here, you know, having it sort of labeled so that you can access it instead of having to dig through the book each time going, did I put that or you put in the wrong folder sucky too you're like oh it should have been there and you're like I know I put it in a folder but it's over here because you didn't have it nailed yet because you're just starting the process so um, and and, you know practice makes better mm -hmm. and so the more you practice creating this organizational system for yourself the better you'll be at it and then your stress level will come down slightly and that's what we want and that is like the biggest part that both of our messages are that part you can control, right? You can't control when your ex does things, when things don't go right, but you can control like your little like paperwork world (laughs) and try to organize that. Yes, for sure. For sure. Yeah. Another huge piece in your book, which I loved was, um, that's the self-care tab, um, was organizing a parenting plan and why people have to get this right. You know, I've talked about it with you. I've got this passion. I've been building this course and I'm just like, don't forget this, don't forget that, don't forget this, right? So why is it so important for people to make sure that the parenting plan is done right? So the reason it is so important is you want to create a plan that you both can live by, that you won't have to be calling your attorney after the settlement is done several times in a row. And here's when I talk about owning your process and being the boss of your process. Mm -hmm. Many people don't realize that you can create custom provisions in a parenting plan as long as you are not in front of a judge. Mm -hmm. So if you are at mediation, if you're doing it collaboratively, if you are doing it, you have traditional litigators, but you're not, you're negotiating through the attorneys and not, you know, with the courts, you can have custom provisions. And what do I mean by that? I mean, for example, if you have a son or a daughter who's turning the age of 18 before the, or before or during the divorce process, and you're concerned about college, or you're concerned about graduate school, or medical expenses, or weddings, or anything that happens within the future of Mm -hmm. signing the settlement, you can offer um, or negotiate with your soon-to-be ex as to how those things are going to play out. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's really important to understand that those custom provisions can be included in a parenting plan, you know, and communication with your spouse is essential. Even, you know, learning tips and strategies on how to communicate with a high conflict person, such as a spouse who has narcissistic personality tendencies Mm -hmm. um, is something that I work with my clients a lot on developing so that really their partners think they have the control, but really it's, you're holding it, right? And um, things think, you know, the more you can include in the parenting plan, the better off everyone will be because the goal of the parenting plan is to love your children more than you dislike your ex-spouse and to create a document that is going to help everyone go on with their lives in the most healthy way possible. Right. And, and for those of you who are divorcing a narcissist, I have something in my book called the gray areas of a divorce decree. And that specifically nails down the parenting plan because you think, oh, I get them Christmas this year. He gets them next year. And 
I've had and have the example in my book that that was what they got. And the lawyer's like, hey, you got what you wanted and walk away. They never went more detailed than that. On that first Christmas, he took the kids and wouldn't bring them back for two weeks because it didn't say when. She's calling the police. That's the gray area. When does Christmas begin? When does it end? When does this particular thing begin? And when do you have to have them back? Now, if that had happened in, in this case, she would have gone to the police and said, look, it says she's supposed to be back by tomorrow morning at nine. Then he would have been forced to bring back the kids. So looking for the what if they don't part of anything that you put into the parenting plan, um, just having just preparing yourself. Um, I was putting in a, a line or a a worksheet, if you would, this weekend for how to make changes to the parenting plan. And it ended up being eight pages long because I was like, well, yeah, there's this situation and you might have this situation and don't forget this because we just go changes to the agreement will be blah, whatever it is. But okay, is it this? Is it that? What, do we, what if we don't agree? What's our not agreement policy? Mm -hmm. If we don't agree, we'll go to mediation. We'll go to parent coordinator. Blah, 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 blah. If you don't put that in, mm -hmm. you just go, if we don't agree, we'll work it out. We'll, we'll see someone, we'll take the court. You're going to be back in court every 15 minutes if you don't define what you need. And if it's defined, they either compel, I mean, comply, or then they're in contempt because it's now in a document, right? And by the way, it does, it's not quick to get in front of the court. So you're waiting a very long time. And you said a lot of important things. I want to call your attention to something that I work with my clients on called bookending. Right. So you're, you were talking about, well, when does Christmas start? When does it end? That is bookending. And that is a really important skill to develop while you're going through the process, especially if you are dealing with someone who has narcissistic personality tendencies. Mm -hmm. You want to, in your emails, you would, if you want a response, you need to set the intention of saying, that, 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 I'd like to hear from you by X. Mm -hmm. The same way you do with your professionals. If you were writing to your attorney and you're asking a question before you end the email, request when you want to hear the answer by. It will create a lot more organization for you, less stress as to when you feel they're going to call you or not. Because remember, again, you are the boss of the process. Mm -hmm. So bookending is a really important strategy to keep in mind as you move forward through the process. Thank you. Really helpful. I'm glad it has a name. <laughs> so if we look at some of the things um, that we want people to know, the most important things that maybe you see overlooked or um, that we want to make sure get into there, what are the most important things? So some of the things, well, there are standard there are standard things that are in all parenting plans, right? Mm -hmm. Checklist, checklist, checklist. But there are things that, that people forget. For example, religious celebrations, mm -hmm. religious schooling. Do, you know, for example, if you're Jewish, I am Jewish. So, um, and it, you want to include, if your children are younger, what about a bar or bat mitzvah? Who's going to pay for mm -hmm. it? Who, are they going to continue their religious upbringing? Who's going to pay for that? What type of religious upbringing will they need? Um, background checks, if you are going to have other people in the home, right? Which chances are they each spouse will find another partner or have different relationships or babysitters or housekeepers. You want, you, you know, if it's something that resonates with you, to make sure in the parenting plan that you're requesting background checks and DMV reports. Mm -hmm. Because to do that afterwards is, you know, very, very um, difficult. And expensive. I mean, you, you're gonna throw away thousands of dollars to just see if the nanny is okay. Like That's if right. that was part of it, the nanny wouldn't have been hired till you got background check. And That's right simple thing to have put in there and it stops the fighting later that's what people are like well if I ask too much they, they won't go for it right 
if you don't ask, you're going to be back in court fighting it. And believe me, when you go back to court, you can correct me if I'm wrong, you go back to court for this particular thing, it, it, they could open up and, and, and throw other things back at you, right? It, it, you're opening up a can of worms and it ends up sometimes backfiring you or you may get that one issue like, okay, they're going to allow the kid to get braces, but that doesn't mean all medical decisions will be decided this way. You're just handling that one stupid issue and now you're going to, you're not like rewriting it right there and it's costly. So writing it once in the beginning and making sure your, your, you know, I's are dotted and your T's are crossed is going to be so much more money saved than if you just let the, okay, let's just have it. I get them this Christmas, you get them this Christmas. No, don't do that. And not only the money, your mental health, mm -hmm. right? And, 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 you know, how you move forward. And, and one of the things I want to say, and I find in my practice, what people fight about the most um, is possessions of the child. For example, Mm. clothes, toys, electronics, sleepy items, you know, teddy bears, things like that. So my suggestion always to my clients and we make sure, and I have an extensive checklist in my book as well that you can take with you to mediation or to your attorneys and you can check off to make sure that you have all of these possible suggestions um, is to put it in the parenting plan. If, if it's a uniform, are you each going to buy uniform? How it, are you going to have a collective account so that each of you are putting mo money in for the uniforms? As specific and detail-oriented as you can be will, will serve all of you moving forward. Absolutely. All of those details. I mean, there, there's so many little things that become a war. You know, you let, you left Johnny's sneakers, in, you know, you didn't bring his soccer shoes and what is your transportation like policy for here's all the soccer stuff he needs this one's got this homework here's the books like putting it together that means it's easier and there's less argument so again attacking that just what we have to do um and also just quickly and remembering because there's so many we're only touching on just a few of them but what i want to remind everybody is think forward not only where you are in your time period, if your children are eight and five, don't just think in the ages of eight and five, think between now and 18, 18 and 26 for the custom provisions, but definitely up to 18. So think about things like, are they going to get a car? If they're going to get a car, who's going to pay for it? If they're going to have any other type of religious celebration, we spoke about that. Who's going to pay for it? How, how is that going to work out? Be forward thinking. Absolutely. That is really important. That's the, that's the biggest mistake I see is people come to me with a parenting plan when the kid was three and they're 15 now and it's not matching up and the, the other parent is like, nope, nope, take me to court. I'm not agreeing. I'm not budging on this. Having an evaluation, which is a part of the stuff I was writing this weekend, when will we reevaluate this? Every three years, every year, every year till they're this age, and then it might coast to every two years. We just check in. Is everything right? Because kids' needs change, right? Again, from a five-year-old to a 13-year-old, they might not want to spend time at the other parent's house because they want to be at their friend's slumber party. Right. Yes. So how do we accommodate that without the other parent like losing his mind or their mind? Um, because that's my day. We have to be flexible and that flexibility has to be built in and analyzed every single year. The kids are different now. They seem to have this or they've got more things on the weekends. How can we readjust the schedule? I don't want to be unfair to you, but we want the kid to be in the sport or the cheerleader, whatever they are doing. We want them to be able to do that. Most important over, over a parent getting their hours. Yes. And that is because we have to set the intention of loving our children more than we dislike or are unhappy with our ex-spouse. Absolutely. Um, I know we had another thing in here that was um, often overlooked. And 
it's like, oh my God, really? Uh, first right of refusal. So mm -hmm. I, I know what it is, but I want you to explain it to people and then, then we'll kind of have a, why that's so important. Okay. So for example, if, I, if you were supposed to um, take your child to your ex-spouse's house on a Wednesday night, right? And um, you, you are not told that your ex-spouse won't be home, mm -hmm. right? You want to know that you want the ability to have first right of refusal. So in your document, what you want to say is if the parent responsible for the time sharing on that particular night or that week is not going to be available, you want the ability to have your child with you. And that is called first right of refusal. Mm -hmm. So um, where we get into this gray area is, and it has to be clearly documented, is what happens if the other spouse gets into a long-term partnership with somebody or they marry them, how does that first right of refusal work? And that is, again, something about forward thinking that you can incorporate into your parenting plan. Right. I, you mentioned like ding, ding, ding went off in my head. The new partner. So whether they've actually married them or not, what is your mm -hmm. policy on, you know, a uh, new supply of the week showing up at, you know, third grade to gather your children. Um, yes. If there's a policy, no, these are who can pick up our children. Maybe yes. it's the grandparents, maybe it's the, the other partner, yes. but not until say a year or until you're engaged, are they allowed to own and have your children without someone else present? If you don't map that out, trust me, it's not going to be pretty and it screws up the children. If they have this revolving door of people coming to pick them up and they're just like, oh, okay, yeah, we had pizza with you last week, but you're, I'm supposed to go with you? Like, it, it has to be mapped out if you are not comfortable with the prospect. And this goes both ways. So if you have a new person, then these rules would apply and you would not send your new person off to um, pick up the kids. Again, going back to your let's get background checks from the beginning okay. of the conversation, that's going to cover your butt. You're going to know that they're trustworthy. You're, you're not going to have the doubts that they are a danger to the children because you have some background. But again, time and having it outlined in the plan is going to be your salvation. One other thing that I wanted to say is also what type of communication are you going to have with your child when your child isn't with you? Mm -hmm. This is so important to think about. I just had a client this week furious because the father punished the son, took away his phone. And every night the mother says goodnight to her son prior to him going to sleep. Well, he prevented her, the father prevented her from communicating with the son. Mm -hmm. Now, had this been clearly stated in the parenting plan that if there is an occasion where the child doesn't have the phone because of, you know, punishment right. consequences, whatever, that the mother, the son is still able to call the mother. Right. Okay? Given access. Here's your phone. You can talk for five minutes. Give it back. Exactly. Exactly. So all of these things, as, as much as you can, you know, really um, do your due diligence, read, read your book, which was fantastic. I mean, I took three pages of notes. I mean, little handwritten, you know, notes. Um, and, you know, mine has the checklist. I, you know, the more you can read, because you'll get bits of information from different resources. Yeah, right. And, and that to me is, you know, when I first started going through this, you know, YouTube was my religion and I'm watching and I'm watching and I'm watching. And it wasn't until I picked up my first book and like, wow, it, it's all there. It's hundreds and hundreds of hours. You and I both know what goes into writing a book. It's, it's thousands of hours of getting the right words, getting the right thought to make sure that they get what they need all for 20 bucks, you know, um, you can pay a coach hundreds of dollars an hour where you can go, let me see what I need and then use a coach or therapist to augment that knowledge instead of like, you know, here, read the book, 
and then if you have questions, it makes it a whole lot easier. Do not like look away from books. They're twenty dollars, and when you are talking about a divorce and four or five hundred dollars for a, an hour for your lawyer's time, get yourself smart because if you know how to prepare, um, then you're going to be much happier during the process. If you are blindsided because nobody's giving you that insight. I never picked up a book throughout my entire divorce and never said, oh, there's a divorce book. I, I just didn't know. If I had had that education, the mystery of what's going to happen, what does this mean? And what is that? Whoa, you know, I would have had so much more like ammunition inside of me and so much more strength and power to not let the things that were being done to me affect me. Yeah. And, you know, you said something and I want to want to what I really loved about your book and what I found about with my book and one of my intentions was, was to create a user-friendly, non-intimidating resource for people. Because when I was going through my divorce many years ago, I did read a lot and the books created a lot of anxiety for me. They were very dense. Mm -hmm. They were, they, they, the, they spoke in legal ease. And although I got some information, I be, uh, they, they exacerbated my anxiety. Mm -hmm. And so your book with all of the examples and the checklists um, really, really allowed me to, to understand and develop some new skills mm -hmm. as, as a coach myself. And my hope is with my book too, they, the individuals will will be able to, will read it. And it will, it is user-friendly. Um, there are lots of checklists and open-ended questions so that they can really think about what they're learning and how they can apply it to their own particular case. Yeah, I think your checklists are amazing because again, yeah. what you're thinking of might be one or two things and you're like, oh, I hadn't thought of that, I hadn't thought of that, right? Well, that totally doesn't apply to me, but you know, it's good to know and how to protect yourself and it might apply and bring in. For example, I was thinking about this last night going, I better ask her about this. Um, so often there's a, a family pet and, you know, they're just like, well, who's getting the dog? And okay, I'll keep the dog because I have the primary house, but the dog is going to cost money. That's mm. another child. If you think about it, it was a family pet. There's vet bills. There's, you know, food, toy, all <coughs> oh, pet walkers. If you're not able to be home, yes. there's yes. so much expense that taking on that without laying it out as if it was another person that has rights because your dog or cat or turtle like it's going to cost you money maybe not so much on the turtle thing or the goldfish but a dog or cat can be so expensive and if yes. you do not put something into this like decree and parenting plan about the, the pets then you're going to be lost a lot of parents will bring the dog back and forth to with the kids mm -hmm. and so if you're doing something like that then maybe the splitting of costs is, is a little bit different. But if you are, you know, bringing the, the, the dog back and forth and they, the other parent says, oh gosh, I can't, you know, take the kids this weekend. Could you cover for me? Because you've got first right of refusal. Go ahead. Do you want the weekend? Even though you might have planned it, I'm telling you the last minute, right? But when they do something like that and you cannot take the dog, I had a client's wife just recently say, well, if you can't take the dog, you're going to take the kids, then you have to pay for the kennel. That's right. It's like, no, no. If it was in there. It's but those things need that. That is about really specifying the mm -hmm. kennel is an expense. And you, what is, what is so wonderful about having a divorce coach by your side as a thinking partner is that one would hope, I can speak only for myself, that I would say, well, let's think about the possible what ifs scenarios. And those are the ones we want, like you just said, if you can't take the, the kids and I have first right of refusal, but I have to put, I'm planning on taking the kids away or I'm planning on, do, you need to have that in writing. So right. the what ifs, and that, that is um, something we spend a lot of time on. So that you really have an air as airtight and nothing is completely airtight um, in, in a settlement agreement. Um, 
but as airtight as you possibly can make it. Absolutely. I have like a whole section on the back of my book. What if, what if, what if <laughs> we have to remember? And that's how we get through a divorce and a parenting plan is to think outside the box. What if they don't? What if this happens? Imagine every situation. And if you are so traumatized, which happens very often, if you're so traumatized, sit down with a friend or a family member or a coach like you or I and go, what am I missing? What, do I, what should I think about with this particular aspect and have them give you feedback, you know, sure. like, like your friends are going to say, oh, you're bringing the dog back and forth. Well, who's paying for the dog? And, you know, the dog comes back to you and, and you have to now take it to the vet, but something happened at their house to ching, right? And, and it's just not fair. You have to map these things out. So pets are your children as well. So yeah. make sure that you add them to the parenting plan. You reminded me of something else that might be very helpful for your readers. I always encourage my clients in the beginning of the process. I know I spoke a little bit before quadrants and I talked about the organizational piece, just so your readers, your, your listeners understand the emotional part, the legal part, and the financial part make up the four quadrants. And in the very beginning of the process, I give my clients a composition book and I ask them to create tabs, four, just four tabs about the four quadrants. I really believe in the power of journaling and doing a brain dump. So, you know, it, 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 you know, there is a theory when you think it, you write it, and then you say it, right? Mm -hmm. And so as these thoughts, these what ifs spiral or come to you, especially when you're going to sleep at night, that, that's when they really occur. You get your journal out and you just Take a few notes and, mm. and you can expand on that. And that can really help you. It can really, really help you. Yeah. You'll think of situations and you'll just, if, if you don't write them down right there, I am a huge journal friend with my 26 new journals out there. And it's all about like document again, that thought of, oh, wow, what, what happened? Like you just had something, you picked up dog food and you went, oh, that was $65 at Costco. Oh, Oh, I better write that down. Carry a little notebook with you because these little things are going to pop in your head like that. Oh, right. We didn't think about that because mm -hmm. you will get stuck with it. If you are with a narcissist, all the responsibility will fall on you as well as the expense. So, you know, I think what we've been talking about here is really teaching them how to prepare. I want everybody to suggest and go get strategies um, and tips from a divorce coach you're going to find these great lists. They're going to be so helpful for you to get yourself um, started and don't stop there. Ask your friends who have older children, what kind of needs does a 13 year old have? What might happen? Start to build that up. And now you've got the little journal and just be writing it down going, okay, at 16, they seem to want to go to friends parties or they might be driving then. What's our policy on the kid driving alone or with friends? what could happen, write it down, and then make sure you get it added in. Now, yeah. with a narcissist, none of this is going to be easy. They're not going to like it. But as you said, these things also benefit them because there's less arguments, there's less drama. And, um, you know, if you can get some of it in there, you're protecting yourself and your family. For sure. For sure. And if you learn some of the strategies and skills necessary to, to negotiate with someone who has narcissistic tendencies. Absolutely. Very important. Absolutely. Well, Jennifer, this has been such a great interview. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us. Thank you for being a team player and really helping to redefine the divorce process. Really grateful to know you and to collaborate with you. Thank you. You're so sweet. <laughs> I'm shy. <laughs> Thank you. I hope you found that helpful. I just love her. She's so super, super smart. And I will hold up her book for those of you on YouTube, Strategies and Tips from a Divorce Coach, A Roadmap to Move Forward. Um, so find her book or find my book too, Divorcing Your Narcissist. You can't make this shit up. Um, there's so much information in here that's going to help you um, nail that divorce by having strategies, by having plans, by learning to alleviate your fears, because that's how they control you. So um, let's get on with our day, but 
try and find those books. And again, this is Tracy Malone from NarcissistAbuseSupport.com. If you are divorcing a narcissist, we have pages and pages of resources that may help you. Everything from free legal ed uh, services for state by state in the U.S. and um, just all kinds of stuff. So come to my website, get some help, and I'll see you soon.